to sing. Go marching in. And I know the song seems kind of a funny way to start it, unless you're a jazz person and it's just a bomb song. But think about it. Jesus said, I'm going back to prepare a place for you. Revelation calls it the New Jerusalem. He said, one day, God's faithful children, the ones who stayed true and faithful to him to the end, his saints, we're going to march into heaven together. Amen? So let's take a look again and be reminded of some of the things that God finds so important for us that he calls our hope. I have three points for you today. My first point is the Ark of the New Covenant. The second point, out of the darkness and into the light. The third point is heaven awaits. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. The Ark of the New Covenant. So much like the Old Covenant, Mosaic Law, it had an ark through which God would flex occasionally. God would exhibit his power through, through this ark, right? It was, it was built... It was basically wood inside and then just layered in gold. It had two cherubim with wings over the top and what they called the atonement seat on there. But God would use this. The people would carry it. And it literally was the thing they placed their faith in when they were opposed by enemies, when things were going wrong. They would use this. Hebrew 9.4 states that the Ark of the Covenant contained the golden pot of manna, excuse me, Aaron's rod that had budded to prove his leadership, and the tablets of the covenant, or the you know, Moses law. We've seen, we've seen the movies, right? You've seen Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Like, we've seen these things where they have the, the ark, which no one has found. So what is the new ark? What, what is this? And what's inside that ark? So the Bible has many indisputable facts, right? Uh, although people will still want to argue those things. Uh, we know that whether we want to argue or not, they're there. The Old Testament is what we refer to as the physical foreshadowing of the spiritual reality that is now. And there are many examples of this. Passover itself, one of the great Jewish holidays, the blood of the lamb covering the doorway of a home so death would pass over them, representing Jesus' blood covering us. So those of us who are truly in Christ have no fear of death. Yeah. Why would I? Yeah. My... My judgment's passed. <laughs> Jesus took it for me. There was the sprinkling of blood and water with a hyssop branch in the synagogue, again, representing Jesus' blood covering our sins. Can you imagine? You would not wear a suit to service because you're going to get sprinkled. <laughs> that had been, man, I hate to be the guy who was like custodian of the temple trying to clean this stuff up. We have the mountain. In Isaiah and Daniel, which represented God's kingdom, the rock that grew into a mountain filling the whole earth, representing God's people, his kingdom, that would start at a certain time in history and fill the entire earth. Hence, the Ark of the Hebrews, representing the Ark of our new faith. Romans 15, 4 says, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures... And the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. We might have hope. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. Our hope in the new ark. 1 Peter 3 and verse 18. Give me an amen when you get there. Okay. Sometimes I feel like I'm going too fast, and I don't want you to miss this. Verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So Peter packs a lot into a very short space. And there's all kinds of directions we could take with teaching in this one. But Peter reminds us that Jesus was the final once and for all sacrifice so that we might have a chance. Jesus... Now, this is convicting. Jesus, Jesus even spent his dead time 
evangelizing those who had already died. And we think it's an imposition to get, have to share on a weeknight. I believe God gave them their chance to make a decision to make Jesus Lord even then. What amazing mercy our God can have on us. God, through Peter, makes a very simple comparison we can easily understand. He compares the ark to the vehicle that saves us now. The very vehicle God plans to use to get you to heaven, his church. The church is compared to many things in the scriptures. And here with some basic understanding of scripture, we can see the ark for us is his church. The ark is what God flexes his power through. The ark is what God shows his miracles through. The scriptures tell us that we are baptized into his church. We're baptized into the body of Christ. We're baptized into the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, Colossians chapter 1. There's a lot of scripture you could throw at this. God uses everyday words or ideas because he knows how we are. He wants to make it very clear what he's trying to say us. Amen. So we see these people in the ark, only eight were saved. And he says it's through the water that now symbolizes or foreshadows our baptism that saves us also. That baptism, only effective due to God's amazingly patient grace and our faith in his resurrection and the hope that we have to come. So through his church, through his modern day ark, we come to find our salvation and we can stay saved and safe. The ark is a place of safety. So it's not ironic God would throw this in there. And baptism, which is such a hot button topic in churches, such a controversial thing. But in the Bible, it's clearly understood. In fact, you can roll through the scriptures all you want to, but you will never find argument about baptism. Because there's only one baptism listed in there. There's only one word, baptizo, an immersion. So even the idea of church today, there are 450 major denominations. 450. Current statistics show there are over 43,000 splinter groups. Meaning branches and branches of denominations or, or little one-off churches, little New Testament churches, little groups or families of churches. But in the first century, there was zero denominations. There's one church in each city, and these people were all consistently, through the book of Acts, baptized disciples of Jesus. There was nothing different. And Paul often wrote his letters just assuming that the reader already knew this, that it was already understood, because the letters written in the scriptures are written to disciples of Jesus. They're often correctives or missives to the churches for false doctrines or teachings that were starting to, to seep into the churches. But he knew his readers had already participated in this same baptism of Christ. Since the Jews were commanded to do uh, circumcision, this became the argument. That was the argument at the time, to be circumcised, to be not circumcised. The Jews were commanded to do so in Mosaic law, so a group began to infiltrate the new fledgling church called the Judaizers. And they had one goal. They would lie about being a disciple of Jesus. Get in and then try to drag the Gentiles, who's everyone who's not a Jew, back into Judaism to pervert the gospel of Christ. But that's a lesson for another day, amen. <laughs> There's no mistake about baptism. Baptizo in the Greek, the only word used in the New Testament for baptism. A submersion baptism of a repentant adult who's been a disciple of Jesus and it is done so for the forgiveness of their sins. Ephesians 4 says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. He is over all and through all and in all. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. Acts 2 and verse 36 says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart 
and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. So Peter is very sure to remind these people, after using much scripture to prove that Jesus was, in fact, their Messiah, he said, they're responsible for Jesus' death. And the ones who get it, the ones who connected and understood that their sin against God made this happen in utter humility, They look at Peter and the apostles and they say, brothers, tell us what to do. How do I make this right? And Peter tells them, repent and be baptized. Repent. It's a mind change. In in Greek, it's metanoia, literally meaning to change your mind or to think differently. Stop doing what you were doing before and do something completely different. In the scriptures, there is no I am repenting. There's, I need to repent, and I have repented, right? It's a change of mind. It's a decision to stop doing the things we know we not ought to do, amen? So Paul told them in Galatians 5, those who continue to live in sin will not inherit the kingdom of God. That willing decision to keep doing those things we know we shouldn't be doing. We know we shouldn't do these things. But he says, if you keep doing this, no kingdom of God. Not here and not after. And Peter says, then, then get baptized. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins and to receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit. What's interesting is you notice after this, Peter has to actually plead the gospel with these people. Some people just still aren't buying into it. And he has to convince them. And he pleads. He most likely, he used a lot more scripture, I'm sure, And he went on literally studying the Bible with these people for most of the day, convincing them of who Jesus was and their part in his death, burial, and resurrection. He begs and he pleads with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And this generation is corrupt. Just as Noah himself had probably done so long before him. Noah, oh my gosh, I do not envy that man's life. Building this ark in the dry land. And the people looking at him going, you are crazy. People were laughing at him. And he's going, get in the ark. The storms are coming. You're not going to survive this. You have to be in the ark because that's what God said. And they laugh at him. They're like, it can't be. No, we don't believe you. It's just, it's just what you say. God won't do that. God loves everyone, Right? Only eight were saved that day. Matthew 7, 14 says, But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and few will find it. In Acts, we see 3,000 were baptized that day, but history shows us there were over 100,000 people in that city. Narrow road. Few will find it. He told them this message isn't just for them or their children. It's for all who are far off, all whom the Lord our God will call. It was for you. Church, 7.9 billion people in this world, and God called you. God called you. What? Like 7.9 billion people. Me? Really? Acts 17 says God arranges the time and place so that we would have a chance, a chance to reach out for him and perhaps find him. Shouldn't that give you hope? Do you realize the trouble that God went through to get you here? You realize the trouble God went through to get the truth of the scriptures through your heart? This should give us incredible hope. Paul taught taught Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. God looked at you and said, you're reliable. I trust you. He said, Ricky, I trust you. 
He said, yeah, yeah, I trust you. He said, I have faith, Joel, that you can do this. God called you. He called you out of this dark world. And it, yes, we'll talk about it later. And into his wonderful light. We get to exchange a life of slavery, of sin, and the filth that we lived in for a chance to live in God's kingdom, to be a very part of the family of God. God gives you nothing but hope. He calls you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. My second point. Come on, Rob. Let's go, Rob. Come First on, Peter Rob. chapter 2. Let's go. 1 Peter 2 and verse 4. The living stone and a chosen people. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him. Excuse me. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Being built like a spiritual house, offering spiritual sacrifices. Romans tells us to be a living sacrifice is what God finds as true and acceptable worship. And we see it again here. It's not just Paul, but Peter relays that same idea that we're to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. He goes on in verse 6, it says, For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. If we come to true faith, Jesus is the rock that holds our life steady. But to those who don't actually believe, it becomes a stumbling stone and the one that will make you fall. They stumble, they stumble because they disobey the message. Ugh. You stumble because you disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you, but you are a chosen priesthood. A royal, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, God's holy nation. His holy nation. Like, I'm a resident of the United States of America. I'm a, I'm a loyal citizen. The Bible tells me to, to be that. But I'm a citizen, and my, my, my loyalty is first and foremost to the kingdom of God. Why? Because he tells me, Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. He says, you're God's special possession. Think about that. Like think about a little kid when they get that, that toy or that whatever that's just mine. That's mine. You can't have it. Can I play with it? No. Okay. I had when I was little, I had this little wooden box with like a hinge lid on it. And we we grew up in an area that had uh, in, it had Indian tribes before us, and there were arrowheads and beads everywhere. And I would collect these and every rock that I thought looked cool or glinted like something would go into this box and I would hide it. I kept it under the mattress on my bed, wow. and no one was allowed to touch that. That was mine. <laughs> I protected it very jealously. That's how God sees you. Ooh. Think about this. When you start to get insecure about things, God sees you as a special possession. Do you not think he's going to guard your life? Do you not know how important you are to him? We need to be reminded sometimes. He says... Your God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. He says he calls you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Now notice it says he calls. He doesn't drag you. He doesn't push you. He doesn't force you. You have a choice. It's comfortable in the dark. This is familiar. I, I, everything's exposed out there. I have things I don't want exposed. I'm staying here. God says, I'm calling you out of the dark and into my wonderful light. He says, but you, you are chosen by God. He calls us his chosen people. That is so cool. Like I get a little thrill. Every time I say that, God chose me. 
7.9 billion people. There's over 1 million people in this valley. Over 1 million people. But you are God's royal priesthood. You are prince and princesses in the kingdom of God. And as such, you're also his ambassadors to the world. So he says, we have work to do. You're to declare the praises of him who called you out. We share our faith. We teach the truth. We study the Bible. Why? Jesus told us the same thing in Matthew 28. He said, disciples, go make disciples of all nations. Baptize them and continue teaching them. He reminds them of who they were. So at the time when Peter wrote this book, they were going through a really, really bad time. You don't even understand persecution like what these people dealt with. They had an emperor who was quite insane. And he was burning disciples live as torches at his parties. This is how bad it got to try and stay faithful as a biblical Christian. So Paul wrote this to remind them, just like we use it now. We need to be reminded sometimes. We forget. They were just like us. It's important to never forget who you were. It's important to remember what you came from, the life that you lived before, the sin and the darkness that God pulled you out of. He says, I don't want you to forget what it was like to be in the dark. God's kingdom gives us so much if we let it. Yeah, Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Let's go. Colossians 1. Just encourage you, bro. Come on. In my brain, every time I go through the first few books of the New Testament, I recite Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's, I, can't, I can't not do it. <laughs> Colossians 1 and verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him... All things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Jesus, the Son, he's always been there. Dustin once did an incredible study on this. You find Jesus all the way back in Genesis. God speaks in plural. Here it tells me that it was through Jesus that everything was created. The spirit was out there just chilling. It says the spirit was out there floating over the water. Like he, had, he had the good part. Like he's just like, hey, you guys do your thing. I'll be right here. God commands it, and Jesus does it. And it says he, this one, that is the head of of the body of Christ, the church. There we see that, that uh, integration of ideas, that the church, his kingdom, is the body of Christ also, his physical body here on earth. It's the way he often finds to meet our needs, to encourage us, yeah. to disciple us when we need it, to help us out. Yeah. But we can sometimes not let it do what it's supposed to do. A hand reaches out to help you, and you smack it away. I don't need help. I can do this myself. Uh, no, you need help. <laughs> the safest place we can be in this world is in his kingdom, in his church. The real opposite of authority is chaos. And that is Satan's specialty. He loves chaos. He thrives on chaos. Why? Because he can hide all kinds of stuff in it. God is a God of order and structure. And in order and structure, we have a safe place. I'm grateful. God gave me very clear parameters on how to live my life. Because if I'm left alone, oh, baby, <laughs> I will find every way possible to mess this up. Not because I really want to. It's just who I am. I, Paul calls this body the, the sinful nature. It gets a permanent part of this. And uh, I love to say I'm, I'm like Jesus, but I got a long way to go. Amen. <laughs> Jesus, his kingdom. We have a king, Jesus. We have a law, his word. He has a people, his disciples, his kingdom. So logic prevails that the kingdom is his church, is the body of Christ. So what should it look like? What should it look like inside there? Look in John 13. 
in his kingdom, in his church, a lot of people trying to be like him, but were us. <laughs> John 13 and verse 34, Jesus himself says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. Well, I thought they'd know because I'm out there sharing my faith. Well, hey, guess what? A lot of people do that. Well, I thought it, because I have all this incredible Bible knowledge. Well, hey, guess what? A lot of people have all that. He says, it's a command. Get around that one. You must love one another the way that I have loved you. You must love one another. It's the benchmark of a church of true disciples of Jesus. Being that involved. So if you're just visiting, uh, you've been attending somewhere else. What does it look like? Do you see people only for an hour or so on that Sunday or maybe twice a week? Or do you have people who are actively, like, coming after you to love you the way that Jesus did? That fellowship should be full of people who are all doing the same thing. And if they're all coming together to love each other the same way, think of what it's like. Yes, it should look different. We probably look a little weird to people. And I'm okay with that. That's a good weird. Because I need to be loved, amen? <laughs> I need people in my life to help me out. I need encouraged. Sometimes I need rebuked. Amen, Dustin? Amen. <laughs> but according to Jesus, it's not optional. Right. It's not just being a Sunday attendee that will mark me as a true disciple of Jesus. It's how I treat the other people in my life. So you must. At times, we don't want to let that happen. But I remember when I first came around. I was the most angry, bitter, caustic person you've ever met in your life. And I'm not exaggerating. I hated you right away. Like, seriously, I hated you. I hated everybody. It wasn't, it wasn't good. I went to Bible Talk that first time, and I know I was like trying to hug a porcupine. I was rude. I was mean. I wouldn't, I, people tried to hug me. I'd be like, just don't touch me. I was dead serious. But you know what they did? They hugged me anyway. <laughs> but I saw that night, John 13, in action. I saw it in such a way it was like a punch to my gut. And I had, a, I had a choice to make. Either I want that or I'm out of here. I wanted that. And I let it change my life. I let my walls down. And I let God's disciples do what they're supposed to do and love me into the kingdom of God. It's how they'll know you're different. He gives us a place where everyone comes together to encourage, to build up. Sometimes we have to fight to keep each other faithful, amen? Yeah. Right. It can be a scary place when you first come around it. But trust me, let down the walls. John 13 is plural. We need to be involved in this as other people are doing the same thing or we cannot fulfill this command of Christ. If you came here today looking to see what you can get out of this, I challenge you, change your mindset. What can you give today? Who can you encourage in the fellowship? What needs can you meet today? Don't come just looking for something that you can get out of this. That's not the way the Bible teaches us. Turn with me to John 15. John 15, in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. Okay, <laughs> that sounds good. If you keep my commands, you remain in my love. Oh, it just got interesting. <clears throat> just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love, I've told you this so my, my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Psalm 119. That beautiful connection. If I actually do his commands, my life gets a lot simpler. I have much less stress, worries, concerns. Why? Because God's kingdom is there. People are helping take care of me. I don't have to stress anymore. If I seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all of these things will be given to me as well. My joy will be complete. Verse 12, he says, my command is this. Here it is again. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You're my friends. Ooh, I can be Jesus' friend. You're my friends. 
if you do what I command. I no longer call you servant because servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. What? If you study the scriptures and find out what it actually means to be a disciple of Jesus, you now know everything Jesus learned from God. Oh, I still, my brain just pops when I read that. Or there's something going wrong in there. I don't know, but I actually heard that one. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you so you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. It's the summation of everything. And it's such a, it can be such a, a like wonderful religious phrase, oh, love each other. But we see the command. He repeats it from John 13 to John 15. John, this is like his thing. It, it pervades his writing throughout all the books that he wrote. And he's known as the apostle of love because John got it. And John was the very last one alive. He actually lived and died in old age. They tried to kill him, didn't work. Tried to bull him in oil. He got out, and the first century church fathers tell us that it was such a major miracle in front of a coliseum full of people that many of them became disciples of Jesus upon witnessing this miracle. Amen. Your life can be a miracle that changes the lives of other people. Amen. He chose you, and then he showed you the way home. You know the way home. My third point, heaven awaits. Turn with me to John 14. That's crazy. Like, you know everything that Jesus knew. You know now his master plan. John 14 and verse 1, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He's like, trust me. I feel like Vic when I say that. Trust me. (laughs) My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so... Would I have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. You know the way to the place where I am going. Wow. Jesus had a plan. It wasn't to convert the masses. He didn't come here to stand there and preach to the thousands, although that happened several times. But it was never his plan. His plan was to train these 12 men that he hand-selected from many other disciples of Jesus and to set them loose on the world. And the Bible says these men turn the world upside down in their generation. And he calls us to be just like them. Amen. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. This was his plan. Jesus came to launch his church, his kingdom. He came to give us the place we get the teachings of the truth Not doctrines outside the Bible, not traditions, but the truth of the scriptures. And a place we could stay safe and get to the end safely together in the ark. We've all seen, did anybody watch that, that, I guess it's been a couple years ago, that latest Mel Gibson movie on Noah and the ark? Uh, Woo! Yeah, I, God love that man. He got a little artistic with a lot of it, but you get the visualization, right? Think about it. Inside the ark. They have food, they have warmth, they have shelter, they have each other. Outside the ark, death, carnage, bodies in the water. Outside, inside. Inside, eight and all were saved in the ark through the water that now symbolizes baptism that saves you also. Inside was warmth and safety. Inside was God's promises that they would arrive safely on the other side, and they did. Why? Because he had faith. No matter how crazy this sounded, Noah had faith. And he acted on that faith. And God made Noah another Adam. He gave an entire world to fill with his progeny. Romans 8 says, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Jesus took my judgment day on the cross. There's no fear of death. Why should I? It's already gone for me. Like, oh, darn, I get a new body. <laughs> I hope you've been around long, but this one ain't doing so good lately. <laughs> Amen. Pray for me. Pray for my dentist. I love that person. 
For those who are in Christ, for those who love God enough to learn what he wants in that relationship and to obey him. You, your sins are washed away. Just as God washed away the sin and the filth of the world in a flood, God washed your sins away in the waters of baptism. No more guilt. No more believing the lies of Satan because God chose you. We must make sure we're in Christ. Romans 6. Romans 6 and verse 1. What should we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We could probably just study that out for a couple people now. Amen. <laughs> he goes on, he says, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we'll also certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him. Oop, I lost my verse. We know that our old self was crucified. So the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Yeah. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Yeah. We're called to take part in his death, burial, and the resurrection. But it doesn't just stop there, right? Just finding salvation here is not the end. True salvation comes when we get to the end. We have to stay faithful. We have to stay in the ark. In his wisdom, God knew we need to be kept busy. And let's be honest, if left alone, we find trouble. God said, okay, I'm going to give you a purpose in your life. Then. I'm going to keep you busy. Go make disciples. Go serve each other. Let's be more honest. The Bible itself says it's to be used to teach, rebuke, correct, and train in righteousness. So, my friends, if this is a novel idea to you, if no one's actually taught you, if they've not walked with you, if not trained you from the scriptures, study the Bible. Find out what it's supposed to look like. Don't, don't be prideful. The people stood there and looked at the apostles in utter humility and said, hey, tell us what to do. Ask the person that brought you to study the scriptures with you. I promise you, what you're going to see when you actually study the Bible is a far cry from what most of us were taught. We're not called to be churchgoers. Jesus didn't use the word. We're not called to be Christians. Jesus didn't use the word. It's only in the Bible three times. It's, it was first founded 13 years later. Jesus said, disciples of me, go make disciples of me of all nations. 1 John 2, coming around to bend. 1 John 2. In verse 1, my dear children, I write this so that you will not sin. <laughs> we'll just stop right there. <laughs> Thank you. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate, advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice of our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we've come to know him if, if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. Oh, John, what are you doing? And the truth is not in that person. But if, any obey, if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we're in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. We have to know. You have to know. I'm not going to bet my forever on a feeling or what somebody said, somebody said. I'm not even just going to trust what's being taught up there, man. I want to find out what does the Bible actually say. If I claim to know Jesus, if I claim to be in a relationship with God, but I don't know what he commands, there's a problem. Please, study the scriptures. You can follow someone around and profess how much you love them, but this does not mean you're in a relationship with them. Probably means you got a jail sentence waiting. <laughs> God has a love language. First John 5 says, love for God is this, to obey his commands. 
If you want to be in a relationship with God, you better learn his love language. Ephesians 2 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's all a part of his master plan. What do we have to look forward to? What is our great hope? What do we get at the end of this fight? Let's take a look. One last scripture. Look in Revelation 21. This is the best they could do to describe what they saw in a vision. Revelation 21 and verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Slide down to verse 21. It says, The wall was made of jasper, and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundation of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh hyacinth, and the twelfth was amethyst. How solid of a foundation is this? The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made from a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold and as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in that city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives us light and the Lamb is its lamp. Heaven is beyond our greatest imagination. And he says, this is your great hope. Eternal life. A perfect new body no more pain, no more tears, no more temptation. We'll wake up there in a moment, have that realization. And it says he'll wipe away the tears because you're going to have that one last moment where you look back and you realize all the ones who didn't make it. We'll shed that one last tear. And it says God will wipe away the tears from our eyes. And then on to eternal glory with a father who loved us enough to die for us. Family, I know you want to be in that number. I know you want to stay faithful to the end. You want to be there when the saints go marching in. And to God be the glory.